Good evening, once again. Um, my name is Pastor Luis Montero. I'm from Barack Apostolic Church, and I just want to thank you, uh, Sister Janae, uh, for this opportunity once again for allowing me to teach this course in homiletics. And um, I want to start out uh, with a word of prayer um, that God may lead me as I teach this powerful subject in homiletics. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you this evening. I pray that you would guide us as, Lord God, I expound upon your word. As I teach this lecture, Lord God, in homiletics, that this lecture will be a blessing to those that will look upon and learn from it. And in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I just want to start tonight with first uh, giving credit where credit is due. I want to say that I will be um, using some slides from our uh, courtesy of Dr. Pablo Jimenez, who is one of the world-renowned uh, professors in homiletics. And um, I'm taking this basic glossary and slide share from him as I teach this course, um, and I hope that you enjoy it. First of all, I want to say thank you again, and I'll start this class now by introducing um, homiletics. And I want to start with the Apostle Paul. First of Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, tells us that Paul, in his writing, the epistle, says that for the preaching of the cross to them that perish foolishness but unto us which are saved it is the power of God here Paul is trying to expound um, and tell the church in Corinth the power of preaching uh, the charisma, the, the, the proclamation of the gospel and he says that the preaching of the cross and I want to talk about preaching tonight, and that's what homiletic is. When we talk about homiletics, we're talking about sermons, we're talking about preaching, we're talking about the, the art and science of preaching and, and, and teaching uh, the Word of God. Um, I want to start off with giving you some bullet points concerning the subject tonight. Uh, first of all, homiletics is the scientific study of the art of preaching. It is concerned with every aspect um, concerning preaching and the task of preaching. From the preparation to the delivery of the sermon, uh, these questions are studied in light of the history and the theology of preaching. Therefore, homiletics is an interdisciplinary field that involves the integration of exegetical Okay, um, theological, historical, sociological, liturgical, and pastoral aspects in the art of preaching. Let me unpack that a little bit. In other words, when we preach, we have different contexts. We have different contexts as far as social, historical, theological, political, and we use these contexts to enrich our sermon. And this is where we get, that's why it's an interdisciplinary field. Because when we preach the Word of God, the Word of God is so huge and so powerful that it, it helps us to look at life uh, with different lenses. And that's why the inter, inter, interdisciplinary field is very important because we integrate the exegetical, which is, which is breaking down the scriptures which is finding out and discovering what the text says. Then we go to the theological, the biblical, the pastoral, and then the historical, the sociological, the liturgical. In other words, it's, it's a service where someone stands before a congregation and delivers the powerful Word of God. <clears throat> and as you may recall, last time that I taught, I taught about hermeneutics. And for those that took the course, I'm just going to say that hermeneutics is the, the, is the theory of interpret, interpretation of text. A biblical hermeneutics is thus the theory of the interpretation of scripture. It comprises the whole interpretive process from the determination of the origin meaning of the text, which is exegesis, 
to the elucidation of its sense of modern errors, which is the exposition. In other words, this is the where we get hermeneutics is the un, the interpretation. And we need a, a good interpretation if we're going to have a great sermon. And then exegesis is the, is the research, the explanation of the interpretation of a document, which is the Bible, which is the scriptures, which is the text. In our context, it denotes primarily the analysis of the Bible. We do an analysis and we analyze the text, which is called the pericope, which is called the, the portions of scripture, and we put it through a light. We investigate what was the writer thinking, uh, where was this uh, uh, epistle or text written, and who was the audience, um, uh, what was going on during that time that this writing took place. So we put it through scrutiny and we analyze the Bible. So biblical exegesis is a vast field that involves historical, sociological, linguistic, literary, and theological analysis, among others. Uh, the aim of biblical exegesis is to determine the original meaning of a biblical text. In other words, if I'm preaching, I love to go to the Greek. I love to go to the Hebrew. I love to go to the Aramaic. I love to go to the original languages. Because from there, we get a, a, an understanding of what the writers were trying to say during the time they were writing, especially in the language. That's why linguistic is one of the categories in the context, because it's very important that you take linguistic, the art, the science of linguistic, because they, 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 the first writers uh, wrote in different languages, not English, it was translated into English, but they wrote in Hebrew. They, then they wrote in Aramaic, and, and then the whole entire New Testament is written in Greek. Um, so it's very important that when you do a sermon that you first research, that you first uh, study the scriptures, that you first uh, analyze the text, that you understand what the writers, uh, the intention, the purpose, uh, why was this epistle, why was this gospel, why was this uh, prophetic saying uh, uh, um, written in the Bible. And the word that brings to mind when we talk about homiletics is the word in Greek. The kerygma uh, is a very powerful word because in Greek it, it's a noun derived from the verb, right? It, which is called kariso, and which it means to proclaim. That's what we do when we preach. We proclaim, we announce the good news. And the kerygma refers to thus to the content of the proclamation. In other words, it's what we're going to do during the proclamation. And, and for those that understand what preaching is, preaching is hard work. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not an easy task. You have to take time to read the text. You have to take time to pray. You have to take time to reflect and, and meditate on God and, and, and really ask God and, and, and then go to, to the sources like uh, a commentary, uh, a, um, a concordance, uh, other books that will help you, a dictionary, and, and then you, you sit down and, and then you try to come up with something s spiritual, something that will edify the church, the body of Christ, or your audience that you're preaching to. It's not an easy job. I don't want to stand here and try to make you believe that by you taking this course in introduction in homiletics that you're going to become a powerful preacher or a teacher. It's not like that. You have to practice. And the art of the, 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 in the kerygma, the kerygma is the proclamation, but it's the content of the proclamation. In other words, what are we going to proclaim if we don't study, right? We, we need to study. We need to scrutinize the scriptures. Uh, um, Jesus even said, search the scriptures, for ye believe that ye have life, but they give testimony of me. And this is Jesus saying, you have to search. Paul goes on to say that we need to study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, that rightly divideth the word of truth. So you just can't stand behind a pulpit and think that something's going to give. You've got to come prepared. Okay, and so the charisma is the proclamation of the gospel, but you also have to have, okay, content. And this is where uh, the biblical theology, the, the writer uh, Paul um, 
uh, Pablo Jimenez, Dr. Pablo Jimenez says that it, it's a technical term that refers to the single core of the Christian message. And very important when you preach, try to stick to the single core. In other words, try to preach one idea, not one, two, three, four, five ideas. It, it's, it's, it's already hard enough to try to preach one idea. So stick with it. It's a core, single core, okay? And, 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 and it's very important that you that you understand that because when, when we start preaching, we, we, we are all over the joint. We, we try to preach about this. We start in Genesis and then we finish up in, in Revelations. That, that's not preaching. The art and science of homiletics is to take a text, okay, and then you dive into that text and you, you read that text if you have to read it 14, 15 times, as long as you're reading that text, memorize that text, let the text speak to you. Don't try to do what I told you the last time. Okay, there's no exegesis here. This is exegesis. Let, let the text speak to you. And then when the text speaks to you, then you start, you know, reflecting on, on what, where is God taking me with this? So it's a very difficult task. But charisma is the proclamation. And then this is where we get the preaching. So preaching is the synonymous of proclamation in, in, in our modern term. So Christian preaching is thus the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the good news, right? <coughs> Sorry. It's normally taken, takes the form of a sermon delivered in a liturgical context. When I say liturgical, it is delivered be before people in the congregation, at a church, and, well, preaching. Preaching is the synonymous of proclamation. Christian preaching is thus the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It normally takes the form of a sermon delivered in a liturgical form or context. When I say liturgical, I talk about preaching on a Sunday, morning or Sunday afternoon in front of an audience and, and you're behind a pulpit and you are to deliver uh, the Word of God as we call it. And nonetheless preaching can also take place in a less structural setting. This is where we have the cell groups where we can preach or teach or we can be in a park or we could be someplace else but it's not limited to only a church setting. In other words, so the fancy word for 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 a sermon is homily. Uh, uh, the homily is a is a short discourse addressed to a congregation during worship. It is usually seen is usually seen as a somewhat contagious commentary on one of the lectionary readings for the day. It flows from the reading of the scripture to the celebration of the sacraments, and then. In some circles, a homily is seen as a specific sermon form. That's Pentecostal. In other words, the word homily is considered to be synonymous with sermon. So when you do a homily, you're doing a sermon. And then we get the word sermon, which is a discourse addressed to a congregation during worship. Therefore, a sermon is a speech event. You stand up and you're ready to go. You have texts. You, you have studied that text, you prayed, you got the Holy Ghost, you got God inside of you, and you're ready to deliver this powerful message that God has given you. And therefore, a sermon is a speech event, not a document. When, when you're preaching, it's very important that you just don't read off from, from, from your notes. It's very important, as you see right now, I'm trying to model that, you know, I got the notes here, but I'm also giving you uh, my attention, I'm looking around, I'm using my hands. Uh, normally, I would, if I'm preaching, I would step out of this pulpit, but because of this presentation, I have to subject myself to this presentation. But for the most part, when you're preaching, just don't read the, 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 the document. The document is there just to guide you. But when you're preaching, you should already know what you want to talk about, where God is going to lead you. You take in some notes, you give some bullet points, but, but, but you pretty much know what you want to say. Don't stand up here not knowing what to say because you don't want to look like a clown. I'm sorry to use that word, but sometimes people will judge us by the way we teach or preach. 
And I just want to say, although it's, it usually involves the oral interpretation of a biblical text, it may focus on telling a story. I'll be talking about that later on. Um, it doesn't have to be just a text. It could be a narrative. It could be a story that has happened in real life, and then you just put on a text that, that goes with that story, and it's powerful how God speaks to us through life. It's called a spice, a slice of life. You have examples where everyday uh, occurrence happen to you, uh, from outdoors, uh, to your house, to your wife. It could happen anytime, and then God speaks to you through that. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, the other day I was preaching, and I walked into this restaurant, and um, this, uh, the lady said to me, are you, are you staying, are you going to eat in the restaurant, or are you taking out? And, and I'm walking through the door, and I'm like, I said, young lady, I said, why are you telling me or, uh, that if I, am I going to order out? I, I came to eat here. And, and she says, well, because you entered through the back door. And I'm stunned. I'm like, oh my goodness, I entered through the back door. No wonder she's telling me if I'm taking uh, some food to take out. So, but that also spoke to me because I preached a message that sometimes as Christians, we're walking through the back door when we should be walking through the front door. You see, so those are spice of life. Those are examples. I mean, you probably have better examples than I, than, than myself right now, but, but that's just a little example to give you of what a sermon looks like. Uh, you use real events, you use uh, things that can happen to somebody or to you. Uh, for the most part, and then you incorporate, you know, the scriptures. Um, but the sermon, the sermon focuses on a story, uh, explores topics, it analyzes, it analyzes events. Okay, uh, you talk about things that happen in current events, the news. Sermons may be classified by the aim to call to faith, comfort, to challenge, to teach. By their forms, they could be inductive, I'll be talking about that later on, or a deductive sermon, or by their sources, it could be a biblical, narrative, or a doctrinal, which is doctrine. Okay, so now I'm going to go into the different forms of preaching. I gave you a little bit of uh, uh, background on homiletics, and, um, but now we have here, this, 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 this is called the Extemporary, extemporary preaching. Uh, Dr. Pablo Jimenez calls um, extemporary preaching as the delivery of sermons without notes. That's powerful. When you probably have memorized your whole sermon, which is powerful, and, and I encourage you to memorize at least 75% of your sermon. Okay, at least. You know, some people use notes. I'm not criticizing. You can use notes. What you don't want to do is this, this. You don't want to do this, okay? Where, where you stand up and, and, and here's your head all the way down and you're speaking to the congregation and, and you're reading off the notes and, and people are like trying to look into your eyes and, and trying to see, uh, what are you doing? Don't do that. So I'm trying to tell you, stand up, uh, stand behind the pulpit, you have your sermon, and you stand up and you deliver, deliver the sermon, but always try to keep eye contact with your audience. And put a smile. I'm sorry I didn't smile a whole lot, but put a smile. You know you're joyful. You got the Holy Ghost. You know you're ready to deliver. You're ready to proclaim the Word of God. I mean, this is a powerful event. I mean, this is God speaking through you so that the people can be edified, that their lives can be changed. God is going to use you to change somebody's life. But this, this form of preaching, um, it, it, it's powerful if you can memorize uh, your notes and pretty much what you want to say. Uh, this one, the expository preaching, is the sermon that analyzes a distinct section of the biblical document, expounding its message for today. Uh, uh, Dr. Pablo Jimenez says, although they usually take a pericope, that word pericope is a portion of scripture. You notice that a uh, portion of scripture starts with maybe verse 1, and then it'll finish it maybe in verse 7 or verse 11. For the most part, a pericope is maybe 1 through 11 verses. It might be a little longer, 
but for the most part is a portion of scripture. What's a pericope? It's where the idea starts and when the idea finishes. Okay? That's what you have to be concerned. Uh, and if you're taking a, uh, the pericope apart, then you have to understand what verse from 1 to 7, what is said in from 1 to 7. That's a pericope. At this point, at their point of departure, they very well may analyze a unit as short as verse. You can use one verse. You can preach one verse. But if you want to preach a pericope, which is probably a narrative, uh, uh, maybe in the Gospels, you might want to take apart maybe four, five, six, seven verses and, and then do justice to those seven, six uh, verses. Um, but you want to analyze this, okay? And, and you, want to, you, as, you want to use this as a unit, as short as verses, as long as a book of the Bible. I mean, this is expository. You can preach, you can probably preach Psalms 119. I, I'm not saying for you to do it, but you can because it's there. But then also you can preach Jesus wept. You know, I mean, it's up to you where the Lord is leading you. But the expository, let me give you an example of what an expository is. I put up on the board, what is expository preaching? And the answer is, the expository preaching involves the exposition, okay, or the comprehensive explanation of the scriptures. That is, an expository preaching presents the meaning and the intent of a biblical text, providing commentary and examples to make the passage clear and understandable. The word exposition is related to the word expose. The expository preacher's goal is to simply expose the meaning of the Bible, verse by verse. As a method, expository preaching differs from topical preaching and textual preaching. I'll talk to you about a little bit later. But to prepare a topical sermon, the preacher starts with the topic and then finds a passage in the Bible that addresses that topic. And I gave you an example. For example, for the chosen topic, if you want to talk about laziness, right? The slugger. You want to talk about someone who's a, who's a lazy person. And then the preacher might refer to Proverbs 15.19 or 18.9. And then touch on Romans 12.11. And then you might want to go from there, you want to go to Thessalonians. None of these passages is studied in depth. Okay, none of them. But you're making reference to them. That's expository. Instead, each is used to support the theme of laziness. So... We move on from expository preaching to narrative preaching. This is all different forms of preaching, okay? Um, and like I said, this is just an introduction to, 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 to homiletics. So this is the field of narrative preaching. It involves at least three related di disciplines. Narrative, sermons, narrative hermeneutics, and narrative theology. A narrative sermon organizes its idea as a plot, I'm going to break this down for you, just trust me. Although most narrative sermons tell either a biblical or a non-biblical story, it is possible to preach narrative sermons based on non-narrative biblical materials. For example, what is a narrative sermon? All right, What a narrative sermon is, I'm saying what it is. Uh, it's the structure and goal of a narrative sermon is a quite different, is quite different from the rest of the preaching. The narrative structure is not built with points, but with the elements of a good story. You like like I just finished up talking about maybe about walking through the back door. I don't know. What a narrative sermon is. Uh, the structure and goal of a narrative sermon is quite different. The narrative structure is not built with points. Well, not three points, but with elements of a good story. Setting, character, development, problem, plot, climax, and resolution. Made for a good story. And I would add an excellent narrative sermon. So when you want to take apart something that has transpired in life, you might want to start talking about it as a narrative, as a narrative, as a story. And then you want to take it apart and then also weave in 
the scriptures and how Jesus and how the Word of God is speaking to you or to the congregation through this narrative sermon. We also have the doctrinal, uh, topical, uh, um, or, or typical, sorry, typical preaching. This is pretty much um, teaching doctrine. If we're apostolic, oneness, we want to teach about the Godhead. We want to talk about how Jesus is the Father, and He's also the Son, and He's also the Holy Ghost. You, you might want to prepare a sermon that speaks about His manifestations in, 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 in verse, uh, and then probably provide verses where, where it probably gives you the understanding uh, of how Jesus is God, or how God, how God was manifested in the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Ghost. But those are things that you can present. And so um, Pablo Jimenez talks about a doctrinal typical sermon, uh, topical sermon is an advanced church position regarding a topic, presenting the consequences of such positions for the contemporary audience. In other words, if you want to talk about why we believe in the oneness instead of the Trinity, you might want to unpack that. Um, but that's that's if God leads you to preach that. Now I want to enter into the realm of inductive preaching. We have inductive and deductive. And in this part, uh, Dr. Pablo Jimenez says that the inductive preaching moves from the particular to the general. It begins uh, searching for clues and ideas that ultimately leads to a conclusion. The scientific method is the uh, primary, uh, premier example of inductive logic. And this is, I'll uh, give you an example of what inductive is. It's like this, uh, the cone. The cone on the top is round, and then all the way on the bottom, it goes down, it's smaller. So you talk about the particular to the general. I'll give you an example. A typical inductive sermon withholds the main point until near the end of the sermon. Okay? You don't want to give uh, uh, the point away. Here you are elaborating and talking about the context and talking about how Jesus walked through Galilee, but you don't want to yet give the audience, okay, at the end. You, it's, like, it's like one of these movies when, you, when you're watching one of these thrillers that, 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 or, or one of these dramas that, that they keep you in suspense. And then you're looking and saying, what's going to happen next and and so you want your audience to to be in suspense this is what in, this is what inductive sermons do they keep you in suspense the shape is outside upside down it's an upside down cone with the wide end at the top and the narrow end at the bottom the narrow end at the bottom represents the main point right the main point at the end the sermon is more narrative in nature in other words, you're, you're, you're speaking about a story. You're telling a story as you are doing the inductive sermon. Both preacher and listeners embark on a journey that ends with a ha ah! moment. This is what Dr. Um, um, Jimenez talks about, a ha ah! moment towards the end of the journey. In one sense, an inductive sermon recreates something of the process the preacher went through in his or her preparation for the sermon. Generally, the preacher does not already know the main point of the sermon. It surfaces at the end of the period of study, reflection, and exploration. So you, when you're studying, you might not even know what you want to really say. But all of a sudden, because you are studying, and because you're doing the exegesis, and because you're doing the prayer, and you're meditating, and you're, and, and you're reflecting, then something comes about, God lights you up, and he said, whoa, this is what I want to say at the end. But that's inductive. Let me move on to the deductive preaching, because I need to move on for time's sake. Uh, deductive preaching is argument, uh, deductive argument takes a given premise um, as its point of departure, uh, deriving from its idea that are, are expounded for the audience. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, deductive, th this is deductive. If the, stere uh, the stereotypical deductive sermon has an introduction, this i.e. example, this morning I went to share three things why you should pray more. This is deductive. This is the, the old-fashioned three-point sermon, right? And you want to talk about reason number one. 
and reason number two and reason number three and then you want to come up with a conclusion and then you want to summarize that it begins with a main point and then expounds that main point you can visualize a deductive sermon as a cone with the narrow end at the top and the wide base on the bottom is flipping it otherwise you're flipping the cone the narrow top is is the main point then the rest of the sermon then widens that point by explaining it and illustrating it. So that's what the, the sermon looks like. Um, you always want to start out, uh, Pablo Jimenez, Dr. Pablo Jimenez talks about that when we want to uh, effectively uh, um, teach and preach the Word of God, we need to come up with titles, a good title. A good title needs to be short but precise. And Pablo Jimenez talks about in your sermon, a title is, is very important. Uh, this is what he says about the title. The title helps the preacher to capture and maintain the attention of the audience. And I want to give you an example of what uh, a definition of the title looks like. A title is a short phrase that announces the topic, main issue, or subject matter of the sermon. The functions of the sermon is to entice the mind of the audience. Very, you know, you want to say uh, you want to say something that captures their attention, leading them to inquire, what is the main idea of this sermon? See, it's 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 an enga you're engaging the audience when you give a wonderful title, but it has to be short to the point. Um, in a way that the title problematizes. In other words, you're come you're making a, the preaching a little complex because people are there sitting one wondering what is he going to say now. Um, it's problematizing the process, inviting the audience to hear attentively what they seek an answer for. Then when we talk about the title, we also talk about the characteristic traits of that title. And this is where Dr. Pablo Jimenez breaks it down for us and he, and he says, an effective title is brief. See, why? you, know, you want to start with, with the title uh, um, and when you put a title there, you say the effective title is engaging. It must not be too funny or cute. An effective title raises the expectations of the audience. Such expectations must be met in the sermon. A title should never promise more than it can deliver. I like that. You can never promise more than what you can deliver. And an effective title is related to the topic. However, it is but not identical to the sermon in a sentence. When I say title, um, normally what I do as a preacher, uh, I start with a title. I start working around myself with a title. But you always need a text. Okay? Always need a text. You know, you want to play around with the title, you can. It's very difficult, I find it, to, to see as uh, I've been preaching for a long time. And one of the most difficult things is finding good titles or enticing titles, you know, some titles that capture the, the attention of your audience. But for the most part, I'm, I'm, I'm still working on that. But, but you need a text, okay? And I say this with a lot of respect. Um, we are not to preach illustrations. We are not to preach people's lives. And we, we are not to preach. We are here to preach the good news. And, and the good news is the Word of God. So when I say the text, you have to find a text. I, I know that there's some preachers that, that they don't even read the Bible and they go into a story and they tell you, and they got people in there because they're good storytellers. You know, they got them captured. But, but trust me, trust me, trust me. And Paul said we preach not ourselves, okay? We preach not ourselves. We preach Jesus Christ, okay, crucified. Okay, and Paul says, whom I am a servant. Okay? We are not to preach ourselves. We are to lift up the name of Jesus. So the text okay, is the word. It's the word of God. Your, your point of reference, okay, your reference, you want to talk about the text. And the text is the biblical portion or the pericope, which I told you, which is the, 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 the portion of scripture that serves as the scriptural basis of the sermon. We need a text. It's important that when you start praying, that when you ask God to give you a word, uh, a word in season, a word out of season, 
that, that you say, speak to me through your word. Because if you want God to speak to you, okay, as a preacher, as a teacher, you might want to start with his word. And then the function of a text, uh, Dr. Pablo Jimenez talks about that it varies according to the type of sermon. Of course, we talked about the different types. But, but for the most part, in, a, in, a, in an expository, in a narrative sermon, the text furnished the main topic of the homily. Okay? In a storytelling topic, like trinal and special occasion sermons, you know, those special occasion sermons are, for instance, you want to talk to the young people. You want to talk to the 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 the, um, the, the women's society, which we call the torcas. Um, we, you want to talk to the men's society, varones uh, cultos, you know, cultos de varones, which we call in Spanish. Um, but but you want to maybe talk about, in particularly, gather a text around that service. Those are special occasion sermons, and the text illustrates the topic. Um, when you have a, 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 a um, title, you have a text, you've prayed, you're fasting, you're seeking the Lord, you, you, you are reading, you are reflecting on the text, you might want to work on the main idea. And lastly, when you have, you have the text, you have... Um, the title, you want to focus on the main idea. You want to talk about prayer, you want to talk about you know, meditating, reflecting on the Word of God. Um, Dr. Pablo Jimenez talks about that it's very important that once you gather this big idea, but you want to talk about just this one big idea, and then you take that big idea and then you want to say to yourself, what is the main idea? What, what, what is it that when I finish, what is the purpose, uh, what's the function of this main idea? And then you, you, you determine, Paul, Dr. Pablo Jimenez talks about, that the main idea is the determination of the, the determination of the main idea, he says, is the sermon in a sentence. Very important when you do homiletics is that when you finish a sermon, you should be able to summarize your sermon in one sentence. If you can do that, then that means that you have a great main idea, okay? But if you have to write three or four sentences, then really your idea, your main idea is not as sharp or as narrow as it should be. Um, when I was taking a course at Princeton on homiletics, they were teaching me, my, my, my professor was teaching me that we need to be precise, we need to be to the point, we need to be, uh, I mean, on target. When we want to say, when the main idea should be just one sentence. And that sentence, you should have the most important step, okay, in the sermon to decide the process. Once you have that whole sentence set up, okay, then you should be able to understand. And then you can even share that sentence, you know, at, at, at your, maybe when you're concluding, when you're finishing, you might say, well, brothers and sisters, uh, uh, the whole, the main idea of this preaching or the, or the main uh, uh, topic or, or what I want to share today is that this blah, 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 blah. I mean, whatever you want to come up with, right? But it's very important that you narrow the main idea into just one sentence. I just want to piggyback a little quickly and, and just talk about this to finish, about the the... The, the title, the, the, the function of the text, the function of the text varies according to the type of sermons. As we spoke about the uh, expository, the narrative sermons, uh, the text furnishes the main topic of the homily. In storytelling, a topical, doctrinal, a special occasion sermon, this is one of the sermons that when you do Dorca service, the varones, the young people service, you want to take a text that will speak to that particular group. That's the, the special occasion sermon. Um, the text illustrates the topic. And to conclude, I just want to say that the main idea, 
when you're preaching, you always want to finish with the main idea. You want to say, um, and Pablo, the Pablo Jimenez says that the determination of the main idea or the sermon in a sentence, it says, you need to finish, when you're doing your homily, when you're doing your, your preaching, when you're teaching, when you're, when you're about to finish, you should be able to summarize your sermon in one sentence. If you can do that, Dr. Pablo Jimenez, okay, he's, 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 he's the doctor in, in homiletics, and, and, and I'm, I've been preaching for a while, and I've taken his advice. If you can do that, then that means that you have really understood, okay, the main idea. Because the main idea needs to be to the point. And I'm going to close with saying that I thank you. Um, I know that this was an introduction to homiletics. Um, and it's very important that we continue to read and study. And I pray that this um, brief presentation was helpful in showing you um, uh, bits and pieces of what homiletics looks like. Uh, I hope to see you again. Uh, my email is um, montero238 at yahoo.com. Please email me if you find this video to be of uh, edification. And if you might have some questions concerning homiletics, uh, feel free to um, email me uh, those questions and maybe we can even speak uh, over the phone. My, my telephone number is 215-771-7147. God bless you. Thank you again. Thank you again, Sister Janae. May the peace of Christ be with you.